Thank you for listening to this podcast on severe postpartum hemorrhage, also called PPH. I'm Tonke de Jong and I'll be moderating this podcast from Court to Add Independent Medical Education. This podcast is an initiative of Court to Add and developed by Obstetrics and Gynecology Connect, a group of international experts working in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. The podcast is supported by an independent educational grant from Novo Nordisk. The views expressed are the personal opinions of the experts. They do not necessarily represent the views of the experts' organizations or the rest of the Obstetrics and Gynecology Connect group. For experts' disclosures on any conflict of interest, please visit the Court to Add website. I'm happy to welcome our two experts in the field of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Could you please introduce yourself, Dr. Amatia? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Homa Amadzia, and I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist at George Washington University, and I've been practicing here about eight years. I have both clinical and research interests in postpartum hemorrhage prevention and management. And why do you think this topic on PPH is important for our listener? So I think this topic is incredibly important. Besides the staggering statistic that every six minutes there's a maternal death from postpartum hemorrhage worldwide, that doesn't capture all the severe morbidity that occurs with postpartum hemorrhage. This can be as simple as severe fatigue, anemia, depression postpartum, and not only affecting the mom, um, but also their immediate relatives um, and obviously future children. Thank you for that clear introduction. I'm delighted to also welcome Dr. Tadanovic for this podcast. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Yamila Stanovic. I'm a senior consultant in obstetrics and gynecology at the Bern University Hospital in Switzerland. I'm also a fellow in fetal maternal medicine, um, and I'm also specializing my research in postpartum hemorrhage and patient blood management. And to me, this is a very important topic close at heart because we still see so many women that are suffering from PPH. It's one of the main causes of maternal mortality. And it's something that we can, at least to some extent, prevent or at least prevent from going from bad to worse. Thank you, Dr. Tsudanovic. The first episode of this podcast series on severe PPH is all about setting the scene with definitions, real world incidents and how to diagnose PPH. I know that there's a lot of lot going on these days in the field. And before moving into specific details, I think it's important to understand how we define PPH. Perhaps we can start off by giving your definition of PPH and its cause, Dr. Tsudanovic. I think that's the very first important point that we have because there are different definitions for PPH and severe PPH. According to the WHO, so the World Health Organization, PPH is a blood loss during childbirth of at least 500 milliliters or at least one liter for severe PPH within 24 hours of delivery. And at our clinic, though, we use a different definition. So we use the definition of at least 500 milliliters after vaginal delivery and then also at least one liter during C-section. And then for severe PPH, we usually use blood loss of about 1.5 liters so yeah, so it's different across uh, the different societies and different countries. Yeah, I'm wondering then if you use the same definition, Dr. Amatia. The definition that we use is greater than or equal to more than one liter of blood loss within 24 hours of delivery. This change was made um, by the American College of OBGYN last uh, five to seven years. And uh, since then, we've uh, primarily used this definition. Thank you. I was um, wondering if you could maybe elaborate on the potential consequences when PPH is not treated correctly, Dr. Amatia. Postpartum hemorrhage is something that affects so many women. And so it's an incredibly important thing that we need to pay close attention to. And in terms of when it's not treated properly, I think often the underlying issue can be delays to diagnosis. I think a delay, whether it's because not enough staff or potentially not enough therapies or medications nearby, those are sometimes contributed to it, or sometimes the patient needs to be referred to an outside treating hospital as well. And I think if these are encountered, often what can happen is you can have more what we call coagulopathies or complications with the bleeding that require additional blood transfusion or end organ damage like kidney failure or other complications. 
So there are a number of different specialties involved in treating PPH. It usually occurs in an emergency setting. How do you deal with these factors, Dr. Tsudanovic? So I think, well, if we start easily with the PPH, so if it's, you know, we just have a blood loss of 500 milliliters, we're just getting started, so to speak. Then, you know, we have the midwives, we have physicians, obstetricians, and then as the blood loss progresses, when, then we do involve, you know, emergency physicians, meaning all kinds of specialties, anesthesiologists, and then also interventionalists, you know, so as, as the severity progresses, then we also have to involve more specialties. And I think as, as Homa was saying that it's so important to be aware to diagnose it correctly and also early on, because the later you diagnose it, the more you delay treatment, the more you run into problems and the more specialties you have involved. So, you know, that's one very important factor of treatment of PPH, that you're in touch before with the different specialties that you know who to get in touch with for treatment and that you're also aware that it, you know, it can happen. And I think that's one of the most important topics or key points of this podcast. As Homa was saying, it's, you know, it's still a very, very much part of our clinical life and it's still very much something that we need to pay close attention to. Yeah, thank you. So it's a lot about good communication, if I understand it correctly. Absolutely. Well, thank you both for this clear explanation on the definition of uh, PPH and also how to deal with it. I would like to continue our discussion on the real world incidence of PPH. As I know, each year about 14 million women experience PPH, resulting in about 70,000 maternal deaths globally. But I know that the incidence differs quite a lot amongst high resource and low resource countries. Dr. Tsudanovic, could you perhaps tell us more about the incidence in high resource countries from the literature and also about your first impression of these numbers considering your own clinic? So if you look at the numbers in the high resource countries, as you were saying, it's anywhere between five to maybe 15 percent, which is still, I think, quite high considering that we have all the resources at our fingertips. Um, and I think in our clinic, we fit more or less in that range. You know, it's probably around 12 percent that we had in the last year because we also see the incidence rising. You know, we see there's more factors contributing to PPH, to severe PPH, despite having all sorts of treatment and management available. If we're now talking about low resourced countries, how do these numbers compare? So unfortunately, in low resource settings, this is the leading cause of maternal death. It is a much um, more serious problem where over 90% of the maternal deaths that I mentioned worldwide from postpartum hemorrhage are occurring in low resource settings. And that has to do a little bit with obviously the infrastructure for the access to healthcare resources or personnel. We mentioned earlier that you need often teams of uh, people if someone becomes very acutely sick. And those um, facilities, even if they are tertiary care, may not have all those uh, team members readily on the standby or available. Um, the other factor for why I think in low resource settings, this is much more of an issue is women globally have higher rates of anemia and severe anemia. And that is a huge risk factor for postpartum hemorrhage. Thank you, Dr. Amatia. Yeah. Do you agree on the differences? Dr. Tsdanovic? I totally agree. It's absolutely true. And I think anemia, is, it is a very big issue. And I think that's also where patient blood management comes into play, you know, because we know that this is one of the causes and that we can have an impact upon, you know, especially given that, as we said before, that we have an increase in risk factors for PPH. But at the same time, we know that there is so many women that don't have any obvious risk factors. So if we try to look at every pregnant woman, and as Homa was saying, look at if she has anemia or not, if there's something that we can modify that we can, you know, already now from the, you know, being pregnant change to prevent it from happening, you know, the, the, there are factors that we, we know we can have an impact upon. Dr. Tsdanovic, why do you think we observe an increase of PPH in high resource countries? So I think one of the main reasons is that risk factors for PPH are also increasing. So we see an increase in women that had a previous C-section, and those women sometimes also have an abnormally invasive placenta, so they have even more of a risk factor. We have older women that get pregnant with a higher risk for preeclampsia, which also increases the risk for PPH. We have um, more women that get uh, pregnant through um, IVF, 
which also increases the risk for preeclampsia and placenta previa, which are one of the risk factors for PPH. So we see multiple reasons for an increase in risk factors, which then in turn again cause a higher incidence of PPH. I understand. Dr. Amatia, do you agree with these risk factors and do you have anything to add? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I completely agree with you, Armila. The patient population is changing um, in the last several decades in the United States. Older age is one that was mentioned. Um, obesity is another risk factor where most associations and literature do um, show that higher obesity status can increase the risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Additionally, I think the diverse patient population that we have in the United States, where we have a lot of um, sometimes immigrant population that may or may not have adequate access for baseline health care needs, um, and so may have undiagnosed or um, not well-treated morbidities um, that come into pregnancy and then tend to have more complications. The other interesting thing is that we do have in the United States women who might have uh, cardiac anomalies that were treated early on in childhood, and then 10, 20 years later, after the therapies and the surgeries became more common, are getting pregnant themselves. So sometimes we'll have women with valve replacements or complex heart uh, conditions, and that is um, an added risk factor. And then one other thing I think that may not be inherent to the patient population, but there is this trend towards a lower kind of trigger, I would say, to transfuse uh, patients in the pregnant population. We've seen that there are higher rates of transfusion associated with postpartum hemorrhage in the United States from the CDC. The literature has shown that. Now, I think that while blood transfusions are safe, there's additional risk factors to them for future pregnancy morbidity, such as developing antibodies. Um, and so those um, are added things, I think, in high resource settings. Do you see the same in your clinic, Dr. Tsanovic? So I think with regard to blood transfusion, we actually have a lower trigger for transfusion. So we actually transfuse less than we used to because we know that there are risk factors associated with blood transfusion. So we are more restrictive with its use. You know, it's again here paying attention to the clinic more so than to the pure lab values. And also when we look at studies, one that we did actually for the trend in blood transfusions in Switzerland, we've seen that it's actually less transfusions over the past couple of years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. I think it's super interesting listening to your discussion on the impact of low and high resource countries on the incidence of PPH. And in the next part of this podcast, I would like to focus on the diagnosis. Healthcare providers diagnose PPH through visceral and physical examinations, lab tests, and the clinical history of the patients. So, Dr. Tsudanovic, could you tell us more about the signs and the symptoms of PPH, please? So, I think one important thing is that we cannot focus too much on the blood loss itself, you know, because we know that we tend to underestimate blood loss during delivery if we don't have any collector bags. It's a more visual estimation, then it's easy to underestimate the actual blood loss. So I think we have to look at the clinical signs first, being tachycardia, being dizziness, um, being weakness, also looking at the pulse, at the blood pressure, and then at the same time looking at the blood loss. But I think it's a combination. I think that's also going back to the definition of PPH, why some countries or some obstetric societies have implemented clinical signs of hemodynamic instability as a definition for PPH more so than the actual qualitative and quantitative estimation. Do you share the same view, Dr. Amatia? Do you also look not only to the blood loss, but also to these different factors? Yeah, I couldn't agree more, um, Yerlila, when you made that point about the absolute number sometimes in, in some ways is a little bit arbitrary because a patient who's maybe four foot 11 and weighs 60 kilos or, or 50 kilos is going to have much less reserve, particularly if they're anemic, right? If you have all those things um, added up, perhaps 500 or 300 blood loss might be enough to kind of tip her over to, to needing much more interventions. Whereas a patient with a body mass index of 50 and no anemia might um, have a blood loss of a liter and then start to show signs of hypovolemia and um, complications. Yeah, so my, my question would be then, how do you differentiate between non-severe and severe PPH? And also, what challenge does it bring in practice? It is challenging at times to correctly make this diagnosis. I think even for an experienced clinician in a high-resource setting, I think you have to be prepared, honestly, um, in any delivery, even if a patient may not have risk factors, 
to kind of always have that in the back of your mind, you know, to constantly be watching how is the blood loss accumulating? Are you accounting for all the blood loss if you're in a C-section? Is there vaginal bleeding that maybe you're missing um, and not factoring in if the patient starts to get low blood pressure or if anesthesia gives them more medications, you have to be kind of always be prepared. And then acting quickly, honestly, to is start with the early interventions, um, simple things initially like fluid resuscitation uh, medications, and then uh, escalating up if you don't see response quickly. I understand. So I think we touched upon this subject already, but I think for our listeners, Dr. Tstanovic, it would be very useful to have some sort of a summary of what measures can be used to diagnose PPH. Blood collector bag, for example, for measurement. And also one of the questions would be, do you use it for every delivery? So this is also considering, you know, going back to high resource, low resource countries, so not very cost effective way to measure blood loss. But of course, it's the most accurate. Then you have the, the pads that you use, the weighing of the pads. Obviously, when you're in the OR, you have an automatic measurement system that um, tells you exactly how much you lost. So these are the main the measurement options that you have. Dr. Amatia, could you please describe which women are at risk for PPH and also how it is determined? Women uh, for postpartum hemorrhage risk, we often use clinical parameters, either their history of postpartum hemorrhage or three prior cesarean deliveries, for example, are some of them. And a lot of times health systems will use risk scores or algorithms to kind of help uh, the clinical staff, whether that's nurses or physicians or physicians in training to alert the entire team, as we talked about earlier, communication is really important. And that helps, for example, at our hospital, we use the Association uh, of Women's Health and Obstetrics and Neonatal Nurses, or A1 risk algorithm. And that's implemented in our, what's called EMR, electronic medical record. So the nurse at the check-in or intake will ask the questions and then assign like a star for a red risk for high risk or yellow for kind of moderate risk and a green for low risk. But it's very important that these can change during the course of the labor if additional things like a prolonged induction process or bleeding during labor happens, those are um, can increase or elevate the risk. Having said all this, um, these risk algorithms are not perfect and they still can miss people. Up to 40% even of hemorrhages can be diagnosed in low risk, quote unquote, low risk women. I know there's efforts being made in the literature to use machine learning and um, additional algorithms to enhance and improve this. Um, which I think hopefully will help in the future. But I can't probably stress enough that even if someone is quote, quote, low risk, um, they still could have a hemorrhage. So we should always be prepared. Always be prepared. Yeah. And besides treatment, prevention is just as important considering the impact of uh, PPH. Dr. Tsudanovic, how can we prevent PPH in specific cases? What can we do? So I think as Homa was saying, I think we need every woman that comes into our clinic, we need to look at the risk factors. We need to, if they're anemic, uh, for example, as I was saying before, and look at the patient blood management, if they're at previous surgeries, and we know that there is a high risk for abnormally invasive placenta, we need to have a good look at the placenta. And at the end of the day, it's it's really just being aware and being aware specifically that there's a risk, as Homa was saying, at every delivery, and uh, that sometimes it doesn't matter how prepared we are, you know, even if we have the high risk classification, if we have managed the anemia, there's still that risk. I think that's probably the most important thing about it, you know, the awareness and, and for those cases that we can do something, do something, but still be aware that it can still happen. Yeah, thank you. I think that sounds really clear. Dr. Amatia, I know you are working a lot on raising awareness around this topic. Could you please... Tell us more about what you do and how you do it. Sure. I'd love to tell you about that. Within the last few years at our institution, we started an effort called Unite Globe, which stands for United Efforts to Reduce Global Obstetric Hemorrhage. And it's really meant for a cross-collaboration between providers, other stakeholders in the field of either development or policy and education to help include um, content around either prevention or treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. And so we have a newsletter that we administer about every three months with the latest in the clinical trials research or events and meetings around postpartum hemorrhage, and as well have a virtual Zoom where we have speakers on the topic of either prevention or treatment of postpartum hemorrhage from all over the world. So something that I hope can uh, build bridges between 
different countries and providers, as I mentioned, in different specialties to really improve uh, the reduction of this severe morbidity and mortality. Thank you, Dr. Ahmatia, for sharing this initiative with us. I think it's great to hear about experts exchanging knowledge and ideas around the world. As we are approaching the end of this podcast already, is there anything that you would like to share that we maybe did not cover during our discussion on PPH, Dr. Tsunanovic? Considering just, you know, management of PPH, prevention of PPH, these are very important issues, obviously. But then we also need to look long term at the patient because there has also been literature and, and there have been studies showing that after PPH, the women still might have some mental health issues. They still might suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. So even afterwards, it's important, I think, for every woman that we see with a PPH. And obviously, the more severe it is, the, the more acutely aware we have to be that later on we talk through you know, what happened because we've seen those women that for us, it seemed still a very part of our clinical routine. But I remember this one case where this woman, you know, she was bleeding not very heavily. You know, for us, it seemed a very manageable situation. But as we were going to the OR, she was telling me, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. For me, it, was, it wasn't as dramatic a bleeding yet when we were going to the OR. And, and her husband was staying behind with the baby and obviously being very scared. So I think it's important that even afterwards, you talk through the family, the woman, that they understand what happened. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing this. Dr. Amatia, is there anything you would like to add to this story or maybe something else we missed uh, in our podcast recording? So I'd like to add um, a point about the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. As your Mila pointed out, um, iron deficiency anemia and being very proactive with either oral therapy or if the patient is not responding IV therapy, it's been really helpful, I know, in our clinic patient population to improve iron stores and, and um, to essentially decrease that morbidity from uh, anemia at the time of delivery. The second point was related to tranexamic acid. And I think here there's an interesting and evolving story with its role for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. Just within the past month, um, we've had a lot of uh, recent uh, publications in the field of postpartum hemorrhage with respect to one is a multi-site large clinical trial looking at tranexamic acid. It did look at, at the time of cord clamp and its use. So I do think in the future we should be looking at even giving it earlier because minutes can matter at the time of a postpartum hemorrhage if it's especially severe. And then the other trial that I think is important to consider is in low resource settings where they showed a, a cluster randomized trial using intravenous fluids and uh, measurements of blood loss and tranexamic acid in uterotonics tonics, as well as a couple of other things. And I, that showed huge reductions in morbidity. And I think these trials are necessary and really should be uh, continue to make significant change in this field. I think there's always a tendency to shy away from doing research in obstetrics because people uh, are a little bit uh, hesitant to consider the pregnant women and the fetus. But as long as the proper safeguards are there, that's the only way we're going to move forward and really make a huge impact in future outcomes and, and reduce morbidity and mortality. Thank you so much for uh, adding these points. To conclude this podcast, because I think we can, we can talk for hours, actually, but we have to uh, go to uh, the closure. What would be your key clinical takeaways for our listeners, Dr. Tzadanovic? So I think it's just a summary of what we've said before. You know, it's basically um, look at the risk factors for every woman. Be aware during delivery that, you know, this woman might have a PPH. Then also usually each clinic has a, or most clinics have a PPH algorithm. So know the algorithm, know where everything is, know, you know who to call. And also I think very important is know your limit to call help early enough. If you see that, you know, it's still bleeding, you're doing all you can, know your limits, call for help early. Would you have anything to add, Dr. Amatia? I think those were great takeaway points, uh, Ermila. I do agree with the quantification of blood loss as much as possible to help better with tracking of a hemorrhage. And every health system is different in their capacity to do that. But I think often that this is important so that you're sort of not missing the hemorrhage. And it's uh, not something you find out an hour or so later and acting quickly. As we said, minutes can matter. And um, being proactive with iron therapy to help reduce the risk of iron deficiency anemia as a contributor to hemorrhage. And finally, maybe um, thinking about therapies early on, or at least having them ready available so it doesn't take too long to administer if you decide to implement them.
Thank you so much, Dr. Amatia and Dr. Tzanovic, for sharing your insights on a topic that you're both passionate about. I have learned a lot from your discussions, and I'm sure our listeners too. So thank you both. If you liked this episode, then please look out for more episodes on PPH, including treatments for severe PPH with a focus on learnings from clinical practice, controversies in the treatment of severe PPH, and new developments in this area. If you're interested in finding out more about PPH, then please visit courtuette.com and select obstetrics and gynecology. If you like this podcast, then don't forget to rate this episode or inform your colleagues about it. Thank you for listening and see you next time. This podcast was brought to you by Court2Ed Independent Medical Education. Please visit court2ed.com for more information.